Let's get this. Let's get the snow is melting and it's going to be 40 degrees today. Smile. Get that smile on your face. All right. And uh, can you match that smile? Can you match it? Get that smile on your face. Turn to the person on either side of you with that beautiful smile. Say, good afternoon. I love you with the love of the Lord. I'm so glad that you're here today. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm going to enter into agreement with your prayers. Father, thank you for the prayers of the righteous that you've just received. Uh, thank you for the word that you've prepared for us today. Every time you speak to us, Father, through your word, and, and we hear it and put it into practice in our life, our lives get better. And I thank you that that's going to be our testimony from this message today, that it made our lives better. Now, Father, let this work go forth with power, anointing, clarity, and understanding. Thank you for deliverance, salvation, healings, miracles, increase, and breakthroughs that shall take place in our lives through this word. And Father, thank you for the authority that you've given us over Satan. So, Satan, we command you to cancel every plan, every scheme, every assignment against this word in Jesus' name. And now, Holy Spirit, we just want you to know that we welcome your presence during this time of the word and touch every heart under the sound of my voice Holy Spirit change our lives by this word today and Holy Spirit I rely on you to word my mouth that I clearly that I accurately communicate God's heart and impart his word into the lives of his people today our confession of faith for this message is that our hearts are good soil Father your word is great seed let this word bring increase not only to our lives but to our families this church, this city, this region, and as this message is heard all over the world, over the internet and over the television airways, uh, as this word goes forth, Father, let everyone that hears this word, uh, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, let heaven come to earth to every hearer of this word. Through Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Give a clap offering of praise if you're in agreement. <clears throat> This is a special time, I believe, a special year, a year, <clears throat> I believe, that will uh, be a year like none other, a year like you've never experienced before if you're a part of the body of Christ, if you're a believer uh, in the body of Christ today. I believe that, uh, that God is ready to do uh, supernatural things in a very powerful way and uh, display who he is, his power, and his glory to the world during this time. Amen? And uh, so for that reason, we're going to believe God for bigger and greater things in our life this year. It, it is the will of God uh, that, that he bless you. Did you know that? It is the will of God for you to experience uh, his blessing and his favor on your life. Abs uh, you know, just keep in mind, you're his children. And he wants, uh, he just wants the best for your life. Amen? And uh, you represent him. And so our theme scripture for this year is Ephesians 3 and 20. And, and uh, in the NIV it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. God wants to do great things. Everyone say, God wants to do great things in my life. Give him praise if you believe that. And he wants us to know that, uh, there is, uh, that his ability is far greater than your asking. And his ability is far greater than your dreams or your imagination. He can go above, exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or all that you can think. His ability is far greater. That means that no matter what the desire of your heart is, that God's power is able to produce it for you. Amen? Amen. And so we've been focusing on things that we need to do to position ourselves to ask bigger and to ask greater and uh, renewing our minds so that we can see ourselves in a way that allows us to, to think outside of the routine and the norms that we've been experiencing. And we've been focusing over the past several weeks on uh, this aspect of Ephesians 3.20 that he's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask. Asking is the key. Amen? Asking is the key. And uh, I'd like for you to turn to First James, I mean James chapter 1, uh, verse 6. James chapter 1, verse 6. And we're going to find the key here uh, to asking. James 1 and 6 says, but when he asked, 
And I know the context of it, he's dealing with asking for wisdom, but it is a principle, a universal principle relating to, to giving in terms of our approaching God. And so it says, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. When we ask, when we approach God, when we ask, we must believe what? And not doubt. I believe this is, this is uh, the key point in approaching God and asking him for his word, his will to be performed in our life. Did you know that if you're asking God for healing, you must believe and not doubt? Amen. Amen. You must believe and not doubt. In order to receive healing in your body, when you go to God with his word and say, Father, your word says that by his stripes, the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. So, Father, I'm asking for healing in my body. When you make that request of God, you must believe and not doubt. You got it? Say, I must believe and not doubt when I ask God. See, believing and not doubting says that I, I, I have faith in the word that I'm speaking. I have faith in the request that I am making of God. If you're going to receive anything from God, you must believe and not doubt. Look at uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. I believe that this is just this series of teachings is just just positioning us for higher levels in 2014 than we've experienced in 2013 in the past. I really believe it. Um, I, I I I just believe, and I mentioned to you last week, uh, the world is just uh, messed up in terms of where where the world is spiritually. Really, just. Uh, just all messed up. We call good evil and evil good. I mentioned it to you last week. I mean, Christians are persecuted for our beliefs now. And did you know that there, there's an, an up uh, uh, rise or increase in persecution of Christians around the world now? I mean, Christians are being significantly persecuted around the world. But, but the world is calling good evil, evil good. They're, 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 they're looking at Christians and calling us intolerant. And things that we used to consider bad, they're calling good now. And uh, I just believe that, you know, God is not in heaven looking at all this stuff play out and, uh, and do nothing about it. I believe that he's going to do some things that are going to turn the attention of man back to him. Amen. Amen. I, I believe that. He has to. He has to. And uh, because if he doesn't, uh, the world is just going to fast approach the doom that's, that's already been prophesied. Amen. And uh, so... Uh, so that's why I'm teaching you what I'm teaching you, positioning you to, to believe God for bigger because he can only demonstrate who he is through us. He can only demonstrate how big he is through us. Amen? And so uh, when we ask, we must believe and not doubt. And then Mark 11:24, 24, whatever you ask for in prayer, these are the words of Jesus, whatever you ask for in prayer, what? Believe, believe that you what? Have received. Believe you have received it, and it will be yours, or you will have it. Amen? So Jesus now, uh, uh, over in James, confirms what Jesus said over in Mark chapter 11. When it comes to asking whatever you ask for in prayer, what is the requirement? I must believe what? That I have received it, and then I'll have it. Amen? Essentially, what the, the two scriptures are saying is you must have your faith in God. You must have your faith in his word. You must have your faith in his authority. You must have your faith in his power that if his word says it, that it is a done deal for you when you ask for it. Thank you for your overwhelming enthusiasm. God wants to demonstrate who he is. And he wants us to not be small thinkers. Did you know that? And uh, I, I, I've said this before in this series. I believe that what God is doing uh, uh, in our spirit man through this teaching is taking us to another level of asking. Because traditionally, we have been need-based askers. We really have. We've just been need-based askers. We're going to God. Uh, the majority of, of, of asking or prayers for Christians is Christians going to God and asking him to meet an immediate need. And uh, we really having transitions to the point of, of asking God to provide vision and not just need, the fulfillment of vision and not just need. Asking him for something beyond your need, something much bigger and much greater. 
That's where he wants to take us. How many of you want to go there? Amen. Amen. So you got to ask in faith. Say, I must ask in faith. faith. And that means you got to believe it's yours when you ask. So uh, last week I began teaching on uh, this this area of asking that we're dealing with, teaching on those those things that may affect your ability to ask in faith. Um, Because if you don't ask in faith, you won't receive. Amen? And so we, we looked at some areas that would affect our asking, faith for our asking. And uh, one of the things that we looked at, uh, the first point was some people don't ask in faith because they don't want to be disappointed. And they don't want to hear a no. Uh, Some people don't ask in faith because of previous experience that they've had with asking God for things. So I asked, you know, years ago I asked God to do something and I didn't get it or I didn't see it. Well, now where you are today, that past experience could affect your faith for asking God for something now. Amen. Amen. And God wants us to get over it. Everybody say, get over it. God also, uh, not God, but one of the other things that affects our faith when we ask God is we question uh, the ability of the one we're asking to do something for us. Now, I know no Christian would ever say they don't believe that God can't do anything. But here's what I know that people go through different periods in their life. Some of us have, pay, have faced some very serious situations in our life that we couldn't see an answer to. It, am I the only one in here that's ever experienced something like that? All right? So many of us have faced situations, uh, and, and we couldn't see a physical solution to it, and we went to God, and because we didn't see a, a response to our request right away, uh, some have entertained whether or not God could actually do it for you. Now, you'd never say it. No Christian would ever say, I'm questioning God's ability to do something for me. You'd never say it. But I'm here to tell you, though, when you go through those tough, tough times, you may not open your mouth and say it, but the thought does cross your mind whether or not God can do it. But I'm here to tell you God is able to do it for you. Amen? Another thing that can affect your faith when you ask God for something is uh, whether or not you feel comfortable with the relationship with the one you're making the request of. All right? Now, take a minute and break that down. All right? You've got to be comfortable with the relationship of the one that you're making the request of in order to ask in faith. Got it? All right? Now, uh, I'll give give you an example. Let's let's make this an example. Uh, How many of you have a personal relationship, have Donald Trump's cell phone number? Okay, no one in this room, right? And uh, let's just say that uh, uh, you had a need for $100,000, all right? How comfortable would you feel going up to Donald Trump and say, hey, Donald, uh, I need $100,000 uh, to take care of the situation that I have. How many of you would feel comfortable doing that? Why? Because you don't know him. You don't have a relationship with the man you have not spent any time talking to him right you don't even send him a birthday card right and a christmas card you have no relationship with the man at all and so you even if you could get to him you wouldn't feel comfortable that he was going to answer your request because of your relationship or lack of relationship with him now Let's transfer that same principle into spiritual things. Many of us, when we uh, find ourselves in situations where we need something from God, many of us don't feel comfortable asking because we haven't spent any time with him. I mean, you have not cracked your Bible. Your Bible has, has an inch of dust on top of it. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? You haven't, you haven't spent any time with him. You haven't read your word, haven't prayed. You know, and I know the arguments. I know the day that we're living in. I know people are busy. Got it? And, uh, and, and so I understand that, you know, that, uh, you know, our days are filled and all that. And, and we find it very difficult, many of us, to carve out a piece of time every day with God. Oh, man, I must have hit something there. 
Now, if I'm talking about you, just keep looking forward, and no one will know that I'm, I'm talking about you. How many of you understand where I'm headed here? And so now here we are. I'm, I'm in a jam. I really need God to do something for me right now, but I haven't spent any time with him. None. And what it does is it, it allows Satan to use that to affect your faith. Because what Satan will say to you is, how dare you think that God wants to hear anything that you need when you haven't given him any time. Am I right? Okay. So that's why here at our ministry, you know, we have a, a Bible reading schedule. We ask our members each day, just read a chapter in the Old Testament, chapter in the New Testament. Just each day. Take some time and, and, and read your word. Then we have a, a scripture that we focus on each week. It's in the bulletin every week. We put it on the announcements every week. And, and it's a scripture of focus and meditation. So this week's scripture is 1 Peter 2.24. You know, and, and, you know and, and, and the scripture, you know, says by stripes, what? Yeah. I'm here. So, so each day we just have to pull 1 Peter 2.24 and just speak it out of your mouth. All right, speak it out of your mouth. And uh, each day, uh, read our Bible prayer list. I mean, our prayer list. It's a confession. It's on our website. And so you just take the time and just read through it. Every time you read through it, you're making confessions of faith for different areas of our lives in this church. Amen? Amen. So read it every day. Well, what's, why why y'all do all that stuff, Pastor Sherry? So that you can stay connected to God on a daily basis. Amen, that I can carve out time each day to spend with God. Because I'm going to tell you something. That time that you spend with God is the most important time of every day. Amen. Amen. The most important time you will spend every day. Amen. Because, number one, it keeps the relationship open. Yeah. Amen. And so it keeps your heart in a position where you know you're communicating with God. He's communicating with you. Amen. And, uh, and, and just praying. You know, just praying. Prayer consists of you, you know, it, it consists of more than just asking. You know, in, in times of prayer, you acknowledge God for who he is. That's why Jesus said when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be the, your name. What is he doing? We're acknowledging the, uh, who God is. We're acknowledging his position in our life. We're reverencing and we're honoring God when we pray. Prayer time should also be time where you just talk to God. Talk to him about the things that you're dealing with in your life, the things that you're going through in your life. And guess what? You don't need to know 100 scriptures. You don't have to memorize 100 scriptures to pray. Right? You don't. Prayer is just, is just talking your heart to God. You got it? And, uh, and, you know, many people want to get all deep when they pray. You know, most heavenly beloved, thy, you know, you know I know thou it heareth me if. You know, speaking King, 16th century English, and, uh, you know, and going through all that, trying to sound holy when you talk to him. You don't need to do all that. You know, God wants you to come to him and say, hey, I'm dealing with some stuff. Amen. Well, hey, God, this is, did you see that? Go to God and say, did you see that? Amen. Really, you, you, you know, we're laughing, but that's the, really the way he wants us to communicate with him. You understand that? Just spending time with him. Why, Pastor said, why do I need to do it? Because it keeps your relationship strong. Yeah. It does. And then when you're in a position where you do need something, because you have a relationship with him, then you're more confident when you go to him with your request that not only he hears you, but he's answered it. Yes. Amen? What does it say in 1 John 5 and 14? 1 John 5 and 14. This is the confidence. This is, see, you, you got to approach God with confidence. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. You see the word of God? So my asking must be from a position of confidence. I must ask the will of God, and my faith won't be affected if I have a good relationship with him, where I'm in touch with him on a daily basis. Amen? Amen. Now, you know, uh, I, I believe this is, this is a good principle to teach during this first month of the year. I really do. Because it, it'll set the tone for the rest of the year for you. If you, if you hear this word... 
and you put it into practice. Did you know the, uh, the Bible reading that we have from the church and the prayer list and all that stuff, do you know that you can do that in about 10 minutes in a day? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Y'all with me? And I know everyone has 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. I know everybody got 10 minutes a day. Yep, you, you are not that busy. All you got to do is, is, is turn off your TV for 10 minutes. Just turn your cell phone off. Some people are hooked to... <laughs> yeah, stop texting. Give your fingers a break for 10 minutes, please. It amazes me at how preoccupied we are today. You know, we, you know, <laughs> we really are being conditioned uh, out of having relationships today. We really are. The whole trend is, you know, let everything be indirect and impersonal now. You know, because I'll be honest with you, I'd rather text than talk. <laughs> and I was one of those, I was one of those texting opponents. I used to get up and, and talk about them in my messages. And I said, what's with all this texting? People don't want to talk anymore. And the only reason I was saying that because I didn't know how to text on my old flip phone. <laughs> I say, now, which is the B? So I'm, you know, I'm just talking. But now that I have an iPhone, please, uh, just text me. Just text me. Just text me. Just text me. We, really, we really are losing the orientation that we have for relationships today. And, uh, if, you know, and, and because it affects our personal relationship with each other, it also affects our relationship with God. You know, because you can't go to God and say, hey, hit me with a text. I get back to you. <laughs> I hit you back. <laughs> no, God said, no, you're going to talk to me. You're not going to ignore my ring. You know my number. <laughs> Put God on your speed dial. <laughs> but we really, we need to keep that relationship. We really need to keep our relationship with God solid. Let this, let this be a year where each day, you carve some time out for God. Some people give more, you know. Some people can give an hour. You know, my time is first watch. I'm first watch. You know what that means? First part of the day is my time. So when I'm up praying at like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. That's my time to pray every night. I call it first watch. So before anybody get up, I'm already, I'm already got, got you covered in prayer. While you sleeping, I'm covering you. You got it? And, uh, and, you know, and I do that every night. I do it every night. So that's my time that I've, what, carved out. Because, you know, for me, at that time, you know, everybody sleep. My dogs ain't bothering me. They ain't looking for a biscuit or nothing. They sleep. They lay down sleep somewhere. And I can just go and pray. Okay, everybody can't do that. Everybody doesn't do that. But can you give God some time every day? Can you carve out 10 or 15 minutes? Every day. Why? Because you need to stay connected. You do. Because I'm going to say this to you. Even when you're connected, it does not exempt you from trouble coming. <laughs> do you hear me? Because trouble's coming whether you're connected or not. It, it, it's better for you if you've been connected when trouble comes than scrambling if you haven't been connected, y'all understand what I'm saying? See, when you, when you hit a serious issue in your life and you've not been connected, you got to overcome a couple of hurdles. First of all, I got I to gotta get in contact with God again. I got to get in contact with him again. And then I hope he hears me, hope he hears me, hope he hears me. Hope he ain't mad at me for not talking to him, calling him, checking on him. Right? So it's the key. You know, coming to church. Coming to church. Y'all know I had to go there. You know, I'm teaching you how to have confidence when you ask because of your relationship. Church, coming to church. Uh, there, there, is, there are some things that uh, you experience in corporate worship that you will not experience by yourself. Amen. Will not. Now, you know, just, you know, the, the scriptural things to support it. I mean, uh, when... When the 120 people was in the upper room, they were together. It says they were all in one place on what? On one accord. And when all of them were together on one accord, that's when the Holy Ghost came. Amen. So what if all of them was in their homes? 
They didn't go to church because there was a game on at noon. <laughs> Chiefs ain't playing, Pastor Lauren. They, they home watching today. <laughs> <laughs> but y'all hear what I'm saying? Uh, too busy. Too busy. There's some things that will happen spiritually, corporately, that will not happen. That you will not experience individually. And I'm going to tell you something. And, and there's something to be said for corporate praise and worship. I mean, there's something to be said for it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more blessed being here praising with everybody else than I am with my own singing. I just can't have the same experience. <laughs> and man, that, that time, there have been times where we've been worshiping the Lord and the Holy Spirit dropped down in here. And to, uh, it, it was about a month ago, uh, during, out of praise and worship, we were all together and everyone was on one accord in that praise and worship. And the Holy Spirit just dropped in, man. Started speaking to us through praise and worship. And when the Holy Spirit got done, I didn't even preach. I closed my notes in my book, and we went home because there was nothing else to be done or said. Amen. Amen. Well, see, you can't get that by yourself. And so, so coming to church, you know, it isn't, it isn't Dr. Joyce and I, man, they need to come to church, they need to come. No, you need to carve out that time of corporate worship. Secondly, everybody's hearing the same word. Everybody's getting a corporate word. And that, that word is coming through the man or woman of God. And God is downloading some things because he knows the congregation and, and all the things that you're dealing with. And he's downloading some things. It'll keep you out of trouble. Some of y'all would, wouldn't be in a situation you're in now if you had come to church. But you, could, you started getting distracted. And now you find yourself in a situation you wish you weren't in because you didn't come to church. I'm preaching good. I'm preaching. Yeah, I am. I'm preaching. I ain't mad myself. I ain't mad myself. Yeah. All of those things uh, equate to relationship with God. And then when I need to ask him, I've been close to him. I, I'm confident that he's hearing me. He know, he know my voice. He may not know anybody else's, but he know mine because I call him every day. I talk to him every day. I can go boldly before him. Amen? And so don't let the spirit of this age keep you away from being close to God because that's what we're fighting. That's what we're fighting. The spirit of this age is saying, isolate yourself, isolate yourself. Isolate yourself. But in the body of Christ, we're one. Amen? <clears throat> and, and each of us need each other. Amen? And we got to be connected to God. We got to be connected to each other. Amen? All right. So y'all got that? Everybody say, I must maintain, I must maintain my relationship with God, my relationship with God. In, order in order for my faith, for my asking, for my asking to, be to be strong. All right. I touched on this a little bit last week. Uh, I want to spend a little more time on this one uh, today. Um, some people don't ask in faith because they don't feel worthy to ask God. They don't feel worthy to ask God. This is, this is one of uh, Satan's biggest weapons against the, the body of Christ in terms of our faith to go to God boldly and to ask for things. Uh, what you got to understand is, number one, see, in order, this feeling of worthiness, you know, uh, there's a little insight just, just in that statement alone. Feeling unworthy, all right? Um, the devil wants you to remain emotional. Because if you focus on your emotions, it will affect your faith, all right? Now, feeling unworthy. Here's point number one, that everyone in here has got to understand. And people get nervous when, when I teach this and uh, other folks teach on this principle. Number one is you got to understand that ain't nobody in the body of Christ perfect. Amen. 
not one. And there's this, there's this, you know, there's this expectation that if you're saved, you know, that your actions always line up with your statement of faith. And uh, I've been pastoring 23 years. And I'm here to tell you, we a trip. <laughs> I wasn't speaking French. We, as an inclusive statement. We are, we a trip. You know, we look good up in here. Y'all see me? Antonio bought me this one. He brought me this one. Took me to the tailor. Man measured me up and stuff. And, you know. Got to cut. Y'all want to see my lining? Check the page. Y'all see that page in line? Do you see that page in line? Y'all got it? By my side here. And uh, so, so, you know, it's tight, ain't it, Trey? It's tight. It's tight. And, uh, you know, so we, we, we look good here. We look good here. And don't be, don't be impressed with the suit. Because what I love about our church, what I love about our church, is you can come here in blue jeans, sweatshirt. If you want to, I love that. You know, I love it. But even in your blue jeans, you think you're straight when you come. And people look at you. And people look at you and they're like, oh, they look so holy. They look so holy. They look holy in those Levi's or whatever y'all wearing nowadays. And, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we, have this, uh, we have this false perception that people are perfect. And I'm here to tell you, ain't none of us. Not one of us is perfect. We're not. I know y'all shocked that I, that I included myself. I'm not perfect. I heard somebody say, that's right. <laughs> you weren't supposed to agree with me so quick. <laughs> and, and, and so... You know, so 23 years of pastor, and plus I've been in church all my life. I've seen it. I've seen it all. I really have. I've seen it all. And uh, so you see people one way here, but see, you don't go home with them. You don't go home with them. And uh, home is different. And uh, I know home is different because I've had children come up to me and say, why my mama cuss at me? I'm like, huh? Your mama cussed at you? She on the praise team. <laughs> I, 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 if I could, if I could tell y'all some of the stuff that I dealt with, uh, it would it would surprise you. And in the early days, it used to surprise me, <laughs> but it just don't surprise me anymore. Why? It's the reason Jesus had to come and die for us. A bunch of imperfect people. I never, I don't never cuss, but you're proud. That ain't bad as cussing, yes it is. Amen. And see, and these little things that we deal with, when we go to God, the devil likes to remind us. <laughs> so soon as you got yourself, yes, I'm going to God with this thing. You get you all set to go. And then as soon as you get ready, and he say, yeah, but remember, remember what you did. Remember what you said. And it affects your feeling of worth. Am I really worthy enough to go to God? And for a whole bunch of us, even though we push through the prayer in our hearts, we still question. But see, he who comes to him must believe and not 
left out. And so um, it's one of the biggest weapons that the enemy uses against us. Even plays this game. Maybe attacks your body with sickness or something happens to your kids. And here you are and you want to go to God with that thing. And the devil has the nerve to say, well, the reason you are dealing with this in your body, you know what you did. You with me? No, that's the game. That's the game. He wants to assign blame so that you don't feel worthy. But I'm here to tell you that God loves you unconditionally. Here we go now. Here we go. Some folks get nervous. Some folks get nervous. When you're preaching this, they're like, you fitting to open a can of something, Pastor, up in here? You're going to open a can of something? Folks don't go sin crazy up in here. You start talking, they don't go nuts. <laughs> but we got to live by the word. God loves you unconditionally. Now, if there was ever a moment in our church where folks need to just be up on their feet, shout, jumping, shouting, running around, that, that was a moment right there. That love, God loves me unconditionally. In fact, while you were still a sinner, before you even ever came, and said, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. You're the Son of God. You died. We're raised from the dead. Before you ever let those words come out of your mouth, Christ died for you. That's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. Guess what? There were no other conditions attached to your salvation. If perfection were a requirement for salvation, heaven would be void and empty of human beings. The only one that would be up there would be angels. Perfection is not a prerequisite. It's the love of God that brought you salvation. You have not earned your salvation. Amen. You have not. It is a gift of God, not of works. So no man start boasting. That's why if you, if you, if you are under a ministry whose doctrine is works-based, it's flawed. Because what it said, the thing that, that, that I could never figure out is why was salvation given to me free, but I got to work to keep it? Amen. I could never figure it out. You keep, and I kept hearing, see, I grew up strong, you know, you know, legalistic doctrine. And I'm like, why would he give it to me? And then I got to work to keep it. You just, I wish you would have kept it because I ain't qualified to keep it. You know, I grew up under that stuff, man. It was hard. It was hard. You know, and they're telling me everything I'm doing wrong to lose it. And uh, I may not have been doing the physical accident, but I was sure thinking wrong. Don't try to figure out what I was thinking. You don't, need to, you don't need to know. You don't need to know what I was thinking about. Don't try to figure it out. Some of y'all still trying to figure it out. Don't, don't try to figure it out. That's between me and God. Ain't got nothing to do with you. Think about, you, think about what you was thinking about. All right? But I was struggling. I was messed up. I was messed up. I was struggling and guilty and feeling condemned and just all messed up because I wanted to do everything just the way they said I had to, to keep it. <laughs> but I would always come up short in, in some area. I'm like, dang, I used to go to sleep. Man. I don't know if I'm going to make it to heaven if Jesus comes. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I hope I do. I was messed up. I was all messed up. 
And then we went to the type of ministry, when you walk in there, the pastor and all them old mothers was the fruit inspectors. You walk in the door. Some may write. Some may write. You know what I'm talking about. Some may write. Come on up here. <laughs> Say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> messed up. Oh, messed up. And Lord, let's not talk about getting the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Because we had to tarry. I mean, we tarried. And then we get there, and they, they tarry with you for an hour and a half, spitting in your face, ain't got no breath mints, all in your face, all in your ear. And they wonder why you ain't speaking in tongues. Because you're yelling, and your breath stinks, and you got spit on my face. I can't get spiritual right now. Excuse me, but I can't. And then after an hour and a half, they have the audacity to come and say, still must be something in your life, the reason you ain't getting it. And I'm like, come on, give me a break. I've been on a three-day fast. Ain't ate no food. You telling me I got something in my life? I was working to be worthy. I'm serious. I was working to be worthy but wasn't taught God loved me and I'm share this with y'all I don't, I, don't, I don't touch on this much I didn't even say this first service because this kind of this kind of too deep for most folks to get God created all this stuff <laughs> I don't know if I should go here. <laughs> How patient would you be with man if you the one that created all, all the stuff? He created the devil. We didn't. I'm getting people nervous. So how patient would you be with the people who have been placed in an environment with an adversary that you don't come prepared to deal with? We didn't ask to come. So how patient would you be? I would be very patient. I would be so patient that I would send a solution for them that they didn't have to work for, whose name is Jesus. And I'd work with them. I'd deposit my own spirit inside of them. To give him some help. Because I created. So, quit being so hard on you. And just accept the love of God for you. Am I telling you to run out and test this theory? No. no. Man, all I've been doing is waiting to hear that, man. Now I'm going to stop by the liquor store on the way home. I wish I was in Colorado right now, so I wouldn't have to go on the corner in the alley and buy it. I'd just go straight up to the counter and get it legally. And uh, I'm not, that's not what I'm telling you to do. 
And y'all know that's not what I'm telling you to do. You know that's not my heart. Because here's the bottom line. There, there are consequences to your actions. Even though the love of God is all over you, there are consequences when you make a decision to step outside. But the good news is, even when you step out, God never leaves you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Never. And how many of you know if God says never, then he means never. When you think he is far away from you, he right there. He, he is not gone anywhere. He's right there. Telling you, hey, I love you. I don't love you no less. Newsflash, I knew you was going to do it before you did it. Still sent my son to die for you. I love you. And you know what he's saying to you? If you don't give up on me, I won't give up on you. I would encourage everyone, you know, let the Holy Spirit do his work in you. You know, he put the Holy Spirit in you and gave, it, gave you his word so that you could be sanctified. Sanctification is a process, not a denomination. The process of sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit in you that as you surrender to it, it causes you to become more spiritually mature. As you submit to him, you'll grow. Amen? And you got to ask yourself, how much do I want to grow? But don't ever substitute your actions uh, for qualification for God's love for you. He loves you. He really does. Which means that you can approach him. You know, there was a boy in the Bible, parable of the prodigal sons. And uh, the boy went to his daddy one day and said, give me my inheritance. And, and the dad said, well, okay, son. And he gave it to him. And then the boy went out and blew it all. He just blew it all. Daddy gave all his inheritance. He went out and blew it all, spent his money on wild living, and uh, found himself in a hog pen. Found himself in a hog pen. And uh, he, he was in such bad shape, he, he, he desired and craved to eat as good as the pigs were eating. That's how bad things got for him. And uh, the King James says it this way. It says, he came to his senses. One day he came to his senses and he started thinking about his father and his father's house again. He had gone way far away, but he started thinking about his father's house. And then he came to the conclusion, he said, you know what? He said, the servants in my father's house are eating better than what I'm eating here. And then, he, then, then because he didn't feel worthy, he came up with a, with a scheme. He says, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to go back to my daddy's house, but when I get there, I'm going to tell my dad I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. He said, just make me like one of your servants. That's what he was, that was his story. Well, why did he develop that story? He did not feel worthy. And then he returned, and he started headed back to his father's house. And before he could even get to the house, Daddy was looking at a distance and saw the boy. Get the picture here. He looked at a distance and he saw the boy and he ran out to meet him. Why? Because that's my son. And he saw his son who had blown all of his money. And he went to his son and notice what he didn't say. He got to his son. He didn't say, boy. I can't believe you blew all my, what you doing my money? When he reached the son, he embraced him. He didn't ask 
any questions about his past. And then he said, go kill the fatted calf. Go get the robe. Go put my ring on my son's finger. Go put some shoes, some sandals on my boy's feet. Because the only people around here that don't wear shoes are servants and slaves. Sons have shoes. Give my boy some sandals. He restored him. He loved him. He never held his faults against him. And what you don't understand, that ring that he put on his finger, that was like an American Express card. That was the family's ring, which meant this boy could go anywhere, purchase anything, show the ring which represented his daddy. His daddy gave him access to everything, didn't ask him about his past. So what makes you think you can't go before your heavenly father? God will forgive you. You know what he said to us? Because he knew us. He says, all right, I understand. It's a process for you all. You know, I had so much in me today. All right, I'm going to let you go. But you are as saved right now as you're ever going to be. I'm going to get back to my point. I'm going to get back to my point. When you came up to the altar, or wherever you were, when you acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God, confessed Him as the risen Savior, and invited Him into your life, you were as saved as you would ever be. You can't get no more saved than you are. <laughs> so you look at somebody and they look like they got it all together, and you say, they more saved than they, I think they more saved than I. No. No, you're saved as you're ever going to be. And so God, looking at us, and his love for us is so great, he said, now here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want you covering up stuff. That's what God is saying. I want you to keep it real with me. And so he said, now, I know you might make some mistakes along the way. He said, but if you do, 1 John 1 and 9, here's what you do when you make a mistake. Come to me. If you confess your sin. I am faithful. Ooh, Lordy. He said, I am faithful. Do you all know what that means? That means that you can rely on me and count on me to do this for you anytime and every time you come to me. If you confess your sins, I am faithful and just, and I will forgive you of your sins. Not only that, I'll purify you. I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He said, just come to me. Don't cover it up. Now, I'm going to say this to you. Some of y'all, you know, some people believe I need to tell somebody. God says, all you need to tell is me. Because here's the thing. God forgives and forgets. <laughs> Folks sometimes don't forgive and they never forget. <laughs> people are trip but he says you can come to me I hope I'm preaching to the right people today I really do this thing has been on my heart since last Sunday God says my people need to hear this so many are struggling and the self righteous are imposing standards and requirements on people that they can't keep themselves He said, let them know I love them. Let them know they can come and ask me. Think about this. Think about this. How, how patient is God with you? Peter comes up to Jesus one day and says, uh, uh, how many times should I forgive somebody if they do me wrong? And then Peter thought he was getting down. He said, seven times? He thought he was getting down for giving him seven times. Jesus said, no, uh, uh, a few more times than that. He said, Peter, I'm telling you, forgive him 70 times, 70 times. That means, you know what Jesus told Peter? He said, anytime someone comes to you and asks you to forgive them, forgive them. 
I don't care how many times they come, you forgive them. So now the question you got to ask yourself is if that is the requirement that Jesus says men should follow, how much more, how many more times would God forgive you? He loves you. He loves you. I'm going to let you go in a minute. I'm going to end here. Being worthy. You got to know that you are because you're a son or a daughter. God wants you to continue to come before him. Don't shy away from it because of your mistakes. And, uh, phew. I mean, I've, I've heard some things in my 22 years of pastoring. And I'm just at a place where I can forgive. And I can see how God restores when you know he forgives. See, the enemy holds you hostage if you doubt whether or not you're forgiven. But God says, I'm faithful and I'm just. There were two people in the Bible who just flat out weren't worthy to ask God for anything. One was the centurion. He was not Jewish. And uh, he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, my servant's sick unto death. Lord, would you come and heal him? And Jesus' response to this man, who was not really worthy, when man asked would he heal his servant, Jesus said, yeah, sure. Matter of fact, I'll go to your house and do it. What did the centurion say? Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. So I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but I still want you to hear my servant. Even though I'm not worthy, I'm still going to ask you. That's the point I'm trying to make to you. I still got, you don't have to come under my house. I ain't worthy for you to come, but I'm still asking you to heal my servant. Jesus, just say the word. So an unworthy person asked Jesus to heal his servant, and guess what? Jesus told the man, he said, man, go. Your servant's healed. Not worthy. And Jesus answered his prayer? Then what makes you think? And the last example was this woman. She's called a Syrophoenician woman because she lived in Syrophoenician. And uh, that's thus, Syrophoenician. <laughs> and uh, so she comes to Jesus, and uh, her daughter's tormented by an uh, evil spirit. And evidently it was affecting her health. And so the woman came, and she asked Jesus to heal her daughter. When I get Jesus' response, she's unworthy because she's not a Jew. And so Jesus... <laughs> says to her, he said, woman, he says, I was called to the lost sheep of Israel. So, what, so she asked him to heal her daughter. What was Jesus' response? You're not worthy. You're not worthy. You're not worthy. The woman, you know, says, come on to the lost sheep. Then Jesus double insults the woman. He says to the woman, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to their dogs. I'm going to let you in on Revelation. He essentially called her a bee. No, I said, no, Jesus, no, no, he didn't call her no bee. What is a female dog? He said, it ain't right to take the children's bread to, and, and give them to the dogs. You're not worthy. You know what the woman said? Bow, wow, wow, yippee, yippee, bow, wow, yippee, yippee. <laughs> You know what she said? Call me what you want to. And then she said something. Deep. She said, Well, don't you know even the dogs that hang around the table get the crumbs? Jesus took a step back. He said, Wow! I've never seen such great faith. A person who isn't worthy has touched my heart. <laughs> 
He said, woman, you have great faith. And guess what? He told that woman, go home. You got it. So my question for you, you're not a centurion. You're not a dog. You're the children. If they can ask, don't let anybody or anything make you feel that you're not worthy to ask your God. Stand to your feet. Let's thank God for the word today. Did God touch your heart with his word? Come on, open your mouth and thank him. It's a good word. <coughs> As the praise team come forward, they're going to sing this song uh, that uh, I want you to get in your spirit. But as they prepare to come, uh, I want everybody to just sit tight for just a moment. God loves you no matter what state you find yourself in right now. There's some people in this room that feel like they're unworthy. There's some people in this room that feel like, I don't even know if I have a relationship with God. Well, I'm here to tell you God loves everybody in this room today. And he wants to be your dad. He wants to call you his children today. And uh, in order for you to become a part of the family of God, I want you to hear this. You'll never get yourself good enough to present yourself to God for salvation. You'll never get yourself good enough. God loves you. And he sent Jesus to die for you, shed his blood for you, so that you could connect with God as your father again. He did it because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you just the way you are right now. And there's some people in here today, you've made some choices, made some decisions, and uh, uh, you wish you could take them back, but, but you can't. And uh, the devil wants you to beat yourself up about it, but I'm here to tell you God loves you. And today he wants you fully restored not in your salvation, but in your relationship with him. He wants all the barriers to be removed. He wants you to come back to him today. It's because of his love for us. Amen. And so I want you to meditate on these words as uh, I prepare to give the invitation. And I want you to let these words just go all into your heart and your spirit. Let it flood you. Amen. Amen.